In this week's In Ear Insights, we are talking all things social media analytics. There's a ton of stuff going on right now. Um, as we record this, social media marketing world is happening. Uh, we have a new partner offering with our friends over at Agora Pulse on social media ROI and our brand new paper on how to identify TikTok influencers, which I think we spend some time on today, especially since a lot of what we've seen around the measurement of TikTok, both influencers and in general, it kind of reminds me of like 2010 social media where people are like, how many views did we get? Um, how many followers do we have? And not really spending a lot of time on more, I guess, sophisticated and or more mature marketing measures. So Katie, when you're thinking about TikTok, particularly since you administer the, the Trust Insights TikTok channel, um, what are you thinking about for our social media analytics as it relates to TikTok? You know, it's... It's tough because there's not, at least it feels like from the outside, there's not a lot of data available on a platform such as TikTok. And, you know, is it is it okay to get a lot of views but no likes? Is it okay to get a lot of likes but no comments? Is it okay to get comments and no likes? Like it's, I feel like it's still something that, you know, I haven't fully wrapped my head around. Like you could break it down and say, TikTok is just like any other social media platform. So go ahead and treat it the exact same way that you would an Instagram or a Twitter <clears throat> or anything else. But it's not though. And I don't, I can't fully articulate why that is. To me, it feels more like a YouTube than it does an Instagram, but it doesn't behave the way YouTube behaves like there is still a search function but you have this whole feed of things that the algorithm is suggesting which youtube has as well but the videos don't automatically start playing and i feel like you have a little bit more control over what you see on youtube i don't know so that's sort of it's i guess the bottom line is tiktok is still a little bit of a mystery to me and i by no means feel like i've mastered it i post our you know, weekly videos and kind of cross my fingers and hope for the best, which is not a strategy, it's, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it is a strategy. It's just not necessarily the best strategy. It's not a good it strategy. Is, it is 100% a strategy. Um, here's what's interesting about TikTok. And I think you highlighted it really, really well, that on social networks, there are two broad general um I guess, approaches. One is a creator approach where you follow specific channels, specific people, things like that, right? You know, follow me on Twitter, follow me on Facebook, like us on LinkedIn, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then there are content-based channels where you put in a topic like in YouTube search, for example, or on TikTok, uh, or, um, you know, take your pick of, of a social network that is content focused where the creator is secondary to the content. TikTok it falls in that latter category. It's more about the relevance of the topic than it mm -hmm. is the the creator. <clears throat> I've been putting up um, my daily uh, posts about uh, standing with Ukraine on my TikTok channel, right? The same things I put on my Instagram stories um, has nothing to do with marketing. And I have like 20 followers on TikTok total, uh, which I'm fine with because it's, it's still just a playground for me. And they're getting thousands, thousands of views um, because people are looking for the, the topic itself. Mm. And even though I'm not building an audience with it, I'm getting reach. Now, is this reach I want to be known for? Well, right now, yes, but in the long term, no. Mm -hmm. But that's the difference between TikTok. Like people think TikTok and Instagram in particular are sort of in parallel. Instagram is still very much a creator focused platform follow us on instagram like our stuff on instagram you know put us you know share our stories and things tiktok is a hundred percent a a a content focused platform and that's the big difference so i still find that to be a little bit confusing because you're saying one's a creator one's a content doesn't a creator create the content like that's where i when you start using those terms that's where i start to get a little confused of like well Either way, you still, as a creator, have to create content that people want to see. So how is that? How is that different? It's I'm, I'm speaking from the audience's perspective. The when you and I as consumers are on TikTok, we are being served up content 
that we think would be interesting to us, not necessarily people, right? Whereas if you go on Twitter, you know, Twitter will say, you know, here's some people you should follow on Facebook. Here's some people you should connect with. And those, those are very much um, personality focused algorithms, right? People you may know on LinkedIn, LinkedIn suggests here's some people you should connect with who went to Boston University or WPI or whatever. Those are people first. TikTok and YouTube are content first. Watch this video. We don't even care who made it. Just watch this video because we think it, you're going to like this particular topic that uh, you've, you've shown interest in in the past. And that's from a creator perspective. That's actually you know, for us as a company. That's a lot harder because normally we're like, hey, follow us on these channels and then you'll see our stuff with TikTok. That's not true, right? The, when you when you open up the app, it says, you know, following and for you. And for you is always the first tab that's highlighted in, in the home screen. And that's just the algorithm saying, here's some stuff that we're guessing you're going to like. Whether or not you follow those people, whether or not you care about those people is irrelevant. It is all about the content itself. So one of the challenges we have with TikTok is, A, is our audience even there? Which some of them are, yes. Um, lots of marketers are. Mm -hmm. But B, are they looking for content that we have to share uh, on there? Are they looking for content about analytics, a change management, or uh, you know, RO, social media ROI? The answer is pretty much no. When you look at, if you, if you type in a TikTok in the he little hashtag search, one of the things it tells you is, how many searches for that particular hashtag? And you look at stuff like, you know, market analytics, like two, <laughs> like nobody's there. Nobody's looking for that form of entertainment on TikTok and stuff. And so one of the challenges we have to figure out is how do we find hashtags that are still relevant because we don't want to mm -hmm. mislead people, um, but have higher reach and visibility for people who are interested in those topics. Well, and I feel like that then, so you're saying that Instagram and TikTok are different, but that is a similar challenge that B2B companies have on Instagram because Instagram is a very visual platform. You have to have a picture, you have to have a video, whereas on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, you don't have to have an image or a video in order to make a post. And so that then becomes a challenge for B2B companies like ours that what we do isn't super visual and us posting a bunch of selfies of ourselves is not necessarily on brand for the company. Um, and so we have a similar challenge with TikTok where you know we're recording this podcast, we have the corresponding video, but is it compelling enough on a platform like TikTok to compete with, you know, people who are making up dances, people are showing you how to cook, you know, puppies doing amazing things. I would say that our video probably in the long run isn't going to do super well compared to those things in terms of why people go onto the platform. Exactly. So uh, our challenge is, can we find things that are still relevant to us, um, but are suited for that platform? Because you're absolutely right. You know, uh, watching some talking heads is not super, super compelling to, you know, compared to like cat videos. One, if you think back to when we worked at, at our old agency, you know, we struggled even then with what to do with Instagram. And the general consensus was show more, you know, employee life, company culture and stuff like that, because nobody wants to read a press release, period. But they especially don't want to read a press release on Instagram. Uh, <laughs> so mm -hmm. the, the challenge became... How do you create content that is sort of that human centric content that that if it's not at least entertaining, at least it's informative and at least it gives people you know, some sense of emotional connection. And that's I mean, that's true of all content, but especially on a content first platform, you've got to have some, you know, the, the, quote the old Bruce Lee, you need emotional content. The, the challenge I always found with that kind of a strategy of like, okay, show more of the staff members, then the account only appeals to other staff members. Because, you know, if I don't work at that company, I don't, or if I don't want to work at that company, I don't care what the teams are doing. That's not of interest to me. So why would I follow that account on a platform just to watch their employees working? 
Like that to me is, well, sort of I, a, I don't know. Well, we used it back then as a recruiting tool, right? Because right. obviously back then a lot of the staff had similar friends of similar backgrounds and, you know, that company needed to as many just, you know, warm bodies with pulses as, as possible in, you know, the junior most seats. Mm -hmm. So when we start talking about social media analytics, um, you, we recently just published this whole paper on finding how to find influencers on TikTok. And so influencer marketing is something that it's not going anywhere. And companies still use influencers in a variety of different ways. So what are some of the big takeaways that you discovered doing this analysis? Because when I look at a platform like TikTok, I'm like, is it enough to just have a lot of views of your video? Like, so some videos get like 2 million likes. Does that make them an influencer? Does it, is the definition of an influencer on TikTok different from the definition of an influencer and, and on any other social media platform? I don't know. Well, here's the, here's the interesting thing. Uh, a, because TikTok uses a similar naming convention as Instagram and Twitter, you can absolutely use the same algorithms for identifying who is most talked about on TikTok. And that's obviously a very simple way to figure out who's, which creators do best. Um, but one of the aspects I think is so important about TikTok's analytics and influencer identification in particular is because it is a content first platform, you can't just pull a list of you know, who's most talked about. Even if you you know, put in it, you know, this, the hashtag of your choice and, and just pull from that data, you still can't rely on that data alone. You have to go the extra step and figure out how aligned is that influencer with your topic of choice. So let's say it's analytics, right? So because it's a content first platform, the audience that follows a creator is there for that, that type of content, right? So, you know, uh, someone may put up, say, you know, 150 skateboarding videos, and they put up one video about the, the, the analytics of skateboarding. I'm just making this up totally. Um, and all their stuff does reasonably well because people like to, to check in on their favorite uh, creators. If you just went with who was most talked about and and picked up that video in, in hashtags, that creator who's making skateboard videos isn't necessarily influential about analytics, nor is their audience there for analytics content, even though they mentioned it, right? You know, maybe it was a, a baseball influencer we're talking about, you know, uh, the analytics of, of, of sports and choosing teams. The, the missing piece to almost every piece of influencer marketing software is going then going through and saying, how topically aligned is this creator on a regular basis about the topic we care about? Right. It'd be like me putting up a TikTok video about skateboarding. Right. If you follow me personally, you know that I mostly st do stuff about analytics and data science. Right. And if I accidentally have to do something about skateboarding, great. If you follow me after watching one TikTok video about skateboarding, you're going to be really disappointed and, and abandon ship pretty quickly when the, the next 99 videos are all about, you know, regression. Um, and so in the paper, we talk about the importance of you must do that validation of topical alignment. Is this the audience of this creator expecting more content about the topic of choice? If you follow me on TikTok, you should expect more for now. You should expect more content about Ukraine, right? Because that's what been, my last 10 videos have been all about. Um, and if you're there for that, great. If you're not there for that, you, it's going to be somewhat disappointing. So that's, I think, probably the most important point of the entire paper is that you cannot approach influencer identification on TikTok solely by who's most talked about. You have to check the topical alignment. So it's interesting. You keep saying who's most talked about. And I think a lot of influencer marketing managers approach it as who's doing the most talking. So why do you always reference it as who's most talked about versus who's doing the most talking <clears throat> for two reasons in network theory there's three different kinds of of nodes within a network right there's an origination node where a network starts there are distribution nodes where 
messages are passed from one node to another. And then there are sort of, you know, um, Oh yeah, so connector nodes and then distribution nodes. Connector nodes are nodes that interconnect other nodes. And there's distribution nodes, which you have one super node that has a lot of other connections. <clears throat> and we tend to, to reclassify those in, in marketing speak as you know sort of thought leaders, mayors, uh, and then broadcasters, right? So a thought leader may come up with an idea. A mayor may connect that thought leader with a broadcaster. And a broadcaster is somebody who's got you know two million followers, and and just they're a, a human ad channel. When we look at how influencer marketing and influencer analytics are done now, how, in most social media analytics, the focus is too much on who's got the biggest mouth or who's got the biggest audience, right? And the challenge with that approach is that if you use that data, you're going to find the people with you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 million, 100 million users in their audience. And it's going to cost you 10, 20, 30, 50 million dollars to interact with it, right? Like you want to find the most influential person on um, on Instagram. You know, it's Dwayne Johnson, right? How much is it going to cost you to do a brand partnership with Dwayne Johnson? It's probably going to be eight figures uh, to do that. Can you identify people that he looks to for, to, for content to share? Now, that's a, a relatively poor example because like 99% of his stuff is about him. Um, but there are other situations where let's say that you and I are on TikTok, and for some reason I've got a million uh, fans, but I reshare like 30% of your stuff. I tag you all the time. If someone was looking for influencer identification and said, uh, you know, Chris is too expensive, but Katie might be less expensive. You know, maybe we'll have to pay her $10,000 to share stuff instead of paying Chris $100,000. And the probability of Chris picking up some of Katie's stuff and resharing it is, is, pretty substantial in that model then you would be the more logical choice for to start for an influencer campaign because you're more of that mayor role than you are the broadcaster role got it okay um and for the record i will always be more expensive than you always <laughs> uh, no and that's helpful because i think that that's something that you know like i know why you have that approach but I think people who aren't familiar with the trust insights version of influencer marketing and social media analytics, why we pick that approach of who's most talked about versus who's doing the most talking. And so, you know, when we put out those network graphs, which if you're listening to this podcast this week, you know, stay tuned for network graphs for social media marketing world coming up. Um, you know, you'll be able to see who's being talked about the most because that means that people were listening to the things that those people had to say versus, you know, the spam bots that are just like pushing out useless information, but yet they are doing the most talking. Um, you know, so what are the other analytics? Because when I look at our TikTok account as a business account, I still feel like I'm pretty limited in the amount of data that I can get uh from tiktok you know i can get likes i can get you know shares i can get the basics and i feel like if i were trying to build a whole strategy around the company's use of tiktok that's not enough for me so what else uh in terms of analytics is available in tiktok or what are some of the things that are available that i'm just not realizing would be useful there's two pools of data that are super helpful. You obviously have things like views and likes and comments on TikTok videos. And those are good, you know, calibration measures to say, like, okay, let's make sure that in our data set of, you know, 10 million posts that we're working with, we're using the top 10% most viewed because we're you're trying to get more views, right? I guess that would be the first point would be like, what is the 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 analytical goal you're after? Right. Um on platform first and then worrying about you know, what happens outside of the platform. But there's the user's bio, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the text that goes with uh, the, the post. And those two things, pretty much every tool ignores, right? A lot of the tools out there, the, the few that are decent, focus mostly on just the hashtags themselves and not the free form text. And when you do an analysis of the bios of the people to figure out like, you know, what information is available to help you understand the audience better. Yes, you have to do some natural language processing on it, but it's very informative because it tells you a lot about the 
people you're evaluating to figure out <clears throat> are these people relevant or not and then the other one is the text itself right when somebody posts you have what 120 characters i think on your average tiktok post to be able to to um identify it you know add hashtags and handles and stuff like that that's valuable space so people will be parsimonious with with you know filler text and, and focus mainly on the content they want to share and that information i think is very very helpful one thing that occurred to me after we wrote the paper is that we should take our um uh, influence identification software and also repeat it just altering the code to see how hashtags interact with each other because i think that would be a very interesting exploration at some point so maybe stay tuned for i don't know version two of the paper in a couple of months but that those two fields contain a ton of information and there's other stuff too um you can see what music people associate with their videos what you know what songs they they work into their videos and i think that's interesting because again that tells you a bit about your audience if you've got a, a set of 10 influencers you've identified and for those influencers you know they share uh, videos with taylor swift's music you know nine out of ten times that's a usable insight into who that audience is you know it's that audience happens to like that kind of music from that and you know and a few other things you can start to make even inferences about who the audience of those people are based on the music they listen to like there's there's you know nine out of ten are sharing uh videos with uh with taylor swift music you know and one out of ten uh got uh i don't know metallica in there then you know that one influencer might not necessarily be aligned with the overall crowd and combined with your own first party market research you should be able to say like yes this influencer is probably aligned with our crowd if you know that your audience is you know 20 to 27 year old uh lesbians then the taylor swift thing is going to align perfectly with that and you're on target right so you have your you have your first party research you have your TikTok data and then you have the network analysis and the natural language processing of that data to say are we aligned with who we think our target audience is it's interesting and so another so i know views are important another important metric as well but one of the things i see a lot especially for smaller accounts like uh animal shelters who are trying to get you know um support is if you view this video four times then it's going to be shown you know uh to more people and so how does the TikTok? so this is another big difference with like TikTok versus a twitter or an instagram or even youtube where it seems like within the algorithm the number of times a video is viewed then sort of changes you know the number of people who can see the thing and so like i said i see a lot of uh, smaller organizations say, you know, please view this video four times so that more people can see it. So how does that factor into sort of the overall, you know, TikTok influencer? So people watch the video, you know, hundreds of, hundreds of times because it's, you know, so entertaining that it then starts to become viral. Is that how that algorithm is working? We don't know. We don't know. Um, we don't know the inner workings of TikTok's algorithm. We do know based on statements from the company uh, that views certainly do count, engagements count quite a bit. So uh, mm -hmm. and and the way it works is it's not a global algorithm. It is uh, a count based algorithm. So if you, Katie, watch, you know, puppy videos uh, for like 10 minutes, very shortly, your entire for you recommendation feed is going to be all puppy videos. Right. Because TikTok is going to say like, hey, I can, see what, I can see what Katie <laughs> likes. I'm going to give her more of what she likes because I want her to stick around on the service as long as possible. Um, and like we started out talking about the content focus of the algorithm mm. is very, very strong where the algorithm is saying, you know, we want to focus on the content that's going to make us stick around regardless of who makes it. So something like an animal shelter video, or, you know, trying to do that. Yes, that will probably have some effect, but getting people to engage with the video is is going to be even more impactful uh, mm -hmm. and making sure that it is tagged properly uh, will be more impactful as well. Because if you if it doesn't have the correct hashtags, if it doesn't have the correct text to make it discoverable for those topics, 
uh, is going to have a hard time being seen. On the other hand, if you have, you know, you, you tag your video puppies <laughs> and it does in fact contain puppies uh, and it, and you get strong engagement from the audience of use it, the algorithm is likely to pick up and say, okay, this one thing should be shown more for puppies. So every time, you know, the, the puppies hashtag is surfaced, let's make sure this video is included in the roster. So it's interesting that you mentioned hashtags. And I feel like this is, uh, it's something that, you know, I can make some assumptions about, but you know, so you would mention it might be interesting to see how hashtags interact with one another. Another thing that I see on TikTok is, um, you know, every few days, a different hashtag is like the thing. And it's always, I feel like it's always like some kind of a challenge. Like right now, the hashtag I see on everybody's video is like The Adam Project, which is a movie that just came out on Netflix. You know, previously it was things like The Mountain Dew Challenge or, you know, who knows what. And those things have zero to do with the videos themselves. But people are trying to use those hashtags to become viral. Like I'll even see people hashtagging viral in their videos. And so I feel like, yes, the hashtags, it would be interesting to see. But at the same time, I also feel like unlike on Instagram, for example, the hashtags are completely irrelevant to the videos. Whereas you know, and I can't say this is 100% true on Instagram, but I feel like the hashtag you see associated with a post are at least associated with the post, like they're relevant to the post. Whereas on TikTok, it could have absolutely nothing to do with the post and people are just trying to get the video seen. And that is partly because people have had less time to study TikTok's algorithm and try to reverse engineer what makes it tick. Um, part of it is because TikTok has been substantially less revealing, even than you know, than than Facebook uh, about the inner workings of that algorithm, and we don't we don't really understand even under the hood how the algorithms, you know, like what the algorithm's architecture is. Is it deep learning based? Is it you know something stats based? We know, for example, that with both Facebook and Instagram, the algorithms under the hood recompile and retrain about once an hour right we know they're very very fast moving and that they the software powering them is almost fully automated we don't know any of that for tiktok we have no idea what bite dance has going on behind the scenes and as a result people are just kind of flinging stuff you know into videos just to see if anything sticks uh and sometimes it does sometimes it doesn't but i've not seen yet anything that conclusively says this is what is likely to, to create the outcome you want. When we look at the data, um, you know, cause we've got, I think about 40 or 50 million uh, videos indexed right now on TikTok. The thing that highlight most correlates with views is really the engagements, the likes and the comments, right? It's, it's very, very simplistic. <clears throat> Looking at the different hashtags, you know, all the ones viral for you, et cetera, have very little relationship to the actual views. Um, and, to the point of being contact content, even the number of followers you have doesn't necessarily uh, have a strong correlation with you know, video views. So it's it's kind of a uh, still a, a bit of a black box. Now, as we continue to accumulate data on it, maybe some more patterns will emerge. But right now, I'm not sure. And you know, I would say we've probably got one of the larger data sets uh, accrued on TikTok, and figuring out like what's making things pop is very difficult. What about length of video? Because I've also seen, okay, I'm trying the seven second video. I'm trying the 10 second video. I'm trying the 30 second video. Um, I would imagine that the amount of time someone spends watching a video is counted toward the, the overall engagement number. But have you found in your analytics that the length of the video itself has any bearing on uh, the ability for it to be shown? A minor one. And I think that is a case where um, the data itself is a little bit spurious. Because logically, if you have a seven second video and someone just happens to you know leave your page up for a minute, you're automatically going to get, what, six, uh, seven more views, maybe eight more mm. views, eight times, uh, eight more views in that period of time than you would a one minute video because logically you know it's it's just much shorter can repeat itself over and over again so that's a case where i'm not sure there's a causal relationship i think it may just be purely correlative 
Okay. Yeah, I also recently saw that TikTok was going to start allowing 10-minute videos, which yep. to me feels a little excessive for a platform like that. I feel like the amount of, and maybe this is just me personally, I feel like the amount of attention span for TikTok is like quick and, you know, fast paced and, you know, you want to keep scrolling through and a 10 minute video is going to be harder to, you know, keep someone's attention, you know, so I guess we'll see what happens there, but that's where it starts to make me think it's trying to be like a YouTube. So it borrowed from Instagram and YouTube in terms of its, you know, UX and functionality. And it's kind of just sitting somewhere in the middle. Exactly. And that's that it really is sort of the essence of <clears throat> this thing has to be treated like its own thing. It's not mm -hmm. one or the other. So you can't copy and paste your Instagram strategy and expect it to work on TikTok, nor can you copy and paste your YouTube strategy. They're different beasts. And that I think is a critical part of understanding your TikTok strategy is you have to approach it as its own thing. You have to treat it as its own thing. So what is the so what of all of this? The, you know, if we're talking about social media analytics and we're talking about influencers on TikTok, it sounds to me some of the so what is it's a completely different beast. You have to treat it differently. You can't use your Instagram influencer strategy and apply it to TikTok. You can use pieces of it, but you have to understand it's not going to be a one-to-one -one match. Um, you know, finding people who are the most talked about is going to be a better approach than people who are just getting the most likes and views because it may just be going into the void. What are some of the other key takeaways? The big one is this. When you are vetting influencers on TikTok, you must focus on topical alignment, right? You must focus on who has, whose audience is expecting the kind of content that you want to be sharing, whether it's on your own channel or with other people's channels. Because as to your point, as TikTok rolls out longer form videos, people will be sticking around to for the content they want. So the accidental stumbling upon you is not going to be a sustainable long-term strategy. Be laser focused on the topical alignment. That makes absolute sense because there is one TikTok account that I fo follow where this woman has nine Newfoundland dogs and every night she records a video of uh, the night night cookies. And so every dog gets, you know, put to bed and they get their cookies. She says goodnight to all of them. I love those videos. But when she creates videos where she's herself on camera doing something, I'm like, I don't care about that. Show me the dogs again. And so it exactly. is interesting, you know, as my, you know, tiny brain starts to put all the pieces together of what you're saying. I'm like, oh, okay, that's what you're saying. Got it. Now it's relevant to me when I apply it to videos of dogs. Such exactly. If you've got some things that you've picked up with on TikTok that working for you, uh, let us know in our free Slack group. Go to trustinsights.ai slash analytics for marketers. And wherever it is that you watch or listen to the show, if there's a platform you'd rather see it on, go to trustinsights.ai slash TI podcast. We can find the show on most platforms. Thanks for tuning in. We'll talk to you next time. Oh, wait, Chris, before we wrap up, where can people find the TikTok paper? Uh, you can go to trustinsights.ai slash TikTok.